Hi everyone, Simon Foster here, Festival Director for the Melbourne Science Fiction Film Festival. Uh, when I started humble bragging that I'm chatting with Richard Masseur, the fan adoration for the man and his career just flowed. Oh, I loved him in It or The Thing or my science project kept coming up, Risky Business, License to Drive, Shoot to Kill, My Girl, Encino Man. Um, the fans came out of the woodwork for you. His latest film is That Alien Sound which has its international premiere at the Melbourne Science Fiction Film Festival this coming weekend. From New York City, where he's treading the boards alongside Anthony Edwards in Prayer for the French Republic at the Samuel J. Friedman Theatre. Mr. Richard Masseur, this is such an honour to be able to chat with you, sir. Uh, well, I'm very happy to be here, Simon. Uh, let, me, let me correct one thing for you and everybody watching. Um, my family pronounces it Masser, though your pronunciation is one I've heard many, many times, as, as is Mazur, Mazur, I mean, all kinds of things, but we pronounce it Messer, so now you know. I do uh, apologize. Don't be embarrassed, because everybody does it. I'll, 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 everybody I'll, does it. I'll, uh, I'll uh, blame my Australian accent for that one. Maybe that just caught us off guard. <laughs> I do so. Yeah, uh, uh, a fleeting glance over, <laughs> glance over your, your vast IMDb list, your credit list, doesn't suggest you've been to Australia. I may be wrong, for film work at least. Have you ever visited these shores? No, and it, no, no. It's one of the it's one of the great holes in my in my whole travel oeuvre, as it were, I, and and in my work um, uh, time. And if anybody's watching who's looking for an old actor, um, I would love to come anytime. I I'm very um, I'm very fond of everything I know about Australia. I um, the the topography, the people. I've met many, 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 many Australians in this business because you guys are everywhere. I mean, yeah. you are the most traveling people on the planet, man. Uh, I've never met an Australian has, that hasn't been to, you know, just 10,000 miles away from home almost all the time. It's amazing to me. Um, you know, for us to go across country is like this big deal, but you guys just go. It's great. Um, and And by the way, not to slight New Zealand, I, I've heard and and had the same experience with folks from your from your neighbors to the north there. Yeah, also. Canada. So, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> well, I don't think they'd like that very much. <laughs> well, maybe they would. Maybe they maybe would. They would. Uh, maybe they would. Um, tell it. Let's get on to that alien sound. Tell us a little bit about your involvement in this very charming, very low budget film. Um, in which you have some lovely scenes opposite the, the, the wonderful Amy Hill. How did how did all this come about? Yeah. Well, um, it happened. They uh, uh, Brandon, uh, the writer director, sent me a script, and I read it, and it was just lovely. And on the email when he sent me the script, he mentioned that Amy was going to be playing the mom, and I had worked with her. Um, several months or a year before in Hawaii on Hawaii Five-0. It was right at the, well, it wasn't the tail end of the pandemic, but it was when things were just starting to open up. Our business was just starting to open up. And 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 uh, Hawaii was famously one of the safest places to go to because they kept such a tight lid on everything. Uh, people coming in and out, you know, you had to be vaccinated, you had to, you know, so um, I talked it over with my wife, and I said, I, I think I should go. And, I did. And, and Amy and I, everything I did, I did with her, and we had a really good time. I'm a big fan of her. She and I have this these weirdly parallel careers. We've both been working. She's done a lot more episodic television than I have. Uh, in, in general, I've done a lot more movies than she has, but we've been going on parallel tracks for almost, I'm, I'm a little older, uh, for, well, a fair amount older, but we've been going on parallel tracks for quite a while now. And, and so I've been aware of her and always thought well of her work. So when they, when they mentioned this, I was, uh, that, that hooked me in and then I read it and I just loved the script. I, and then Brandon also sent me a kind of a sizzle reel. It was uh, it was just really the first like ten or twelve minutes of the film, um, the opening 
of the film mm -hmm. and um, and the work that was going on, uh, and it wasn't color corrected, it was rough cut, but the work that was going on on screen and behind the camera in that first scene, the transitions she was going through and the, and the very simple way this was being, you know, without any bells and whistles or CGI sure. or anything, this just very simple, um, human slash not human performance <laughs> uh that 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 sealed the deal for me i was very much looking forward to to working with both of them yeah me is wonderful in the role and, and it was interesting when i spoke to uh brandon the other day um i asked him his inspirations for the film and and he was a little surprised that he, it, it, it had been singled out as a, a science fiction film because his inspirations were things like Ruby Sparks and Annie Hall and that that sort of relationship um, comedy drama and, and I said well it's alien in the title that is good enough for the Melbourne Science mm -hmm. Fiction Film Festival so it's, it's well wonderful. it is I mean it's absolutely science fiction in in the purest sense of the word I'm yeah. a huge fan of kind of what if science fiction um, you know um, future shock science fiction um, and 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 also you know the rubber people and you know crazy shit and, and all like that I, I i like it all i've been a fan since i was a, a little kid and 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 when uh i mean but but when you have something that involves this amazing concept that he has i don't want to put a spoiler on this but this amazing concept he has about this entity and what it is and how it is and it gets your brain going whoa could that be <laughs> right you know and i let on the uh, you know the whole body swapping or soul swapping thing um which by the way there are a lot of other references too but but yeah. but he manages to avoid i think all of the pitfalls in this really just piercingly sweet story and um you know it's not I, for for your audience, I don't know what your audience is like. They may be more into shit blowing up, and and oh, good for them. By the way, I'm <laughs> I, I don't mind that, and you know, people's faces melting and everything. But 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 this is this is this is thinking science fiction uh, in the purest form, I think, and I think it was a brilliant choice on your part. Nice. And Melbourne is it's such a film community. It's such a film town. I mean, you know, I know you guys get sick of hearing this, but you know, you are Australia's Hollywood, and 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 um, better than Australia's Hollywood, I would say. I mean, better than Hollywood in that you're more provocative and more um, um, chance taking, and and you also have funneled more astonishing talent into this industry out of that one city than you know, I think almost any other city in the world. It's really quite extraordinary. That's very kind of you to say, and it certainly reflects, A, why I programmed this film, because it, 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 I know that the Melbourne audience are open to these um, offbeat, off-centre, more challenging, more thoughtful science fiction films. And you're right, Melbourne is is very much an international city that, that I think will welcome that alien sound. So that's, thank you very much for your kind words. You you take a you take an executive producer credit on the film, which suggests you played sort of the the elder statesman role, if you if you'll like allow me that term on on his on Brandon's um, Brandon's uh, directing debut. All humility yeah. aside, what does your experience and and industry wisdom uh, bring to a shoot like that Alien Sound? Well, I mean, for the relative look, you have to remember this whole thing was shot in an extremely short schedule uh, under extremely, extremely, you know, skin of the teeth um, um, operating budget and production possibilities. And, and what, what's come out of it is I think a really completely professional looking, um, really good piece of work, uh, which is, a, you know, this is a term that gets thrown around a lot, but it, it really is a, um, 
a, a project that's based almost entirely on goodwill and love. You know, I mean, everybody involved in this did it because they wanted to be part of it, did it because they cared about the piece. And once you meet these two people, and I hope they get there to the festival, I hope you have the wherewithal to bring them there. Well, they're coming down. They're, yes, they they're, oh, good. Oh, good. I wish I could. I really, I really do. I mean, that would be a guess. But um, um, I don't even know when it is, by the way. When is it? Uh, we're screening on Saturday at uh, 1 p.m. here in Melbourne. In, in oh, this coming Saturday. It's oh, it's like this weekend, now. yes. Wow. No, yeah. I'm doing a play. Okay, so I can't. So you lucked out. I can't do it. I, so you don't <laughs> have to feel bad. Uh, anyway, but once you you meet these two people in the flesh, everybody is going to fall in love with them. They're just, they are, I mean, they're just amazing, two young, amazing people. And um, uh, Brandon was kind enough to offer me that credit because I I wanted to help them out a little bit financially to to get this thing finished and and I was able to do it and I'm delighted that it's uh, going to get some public response you know some uh, and some thoughtful uh, it's not in some jerkwater American town that where nobody knows anything about anything but in Melbourne Australia where you have a really thoughtful, uh, educated group of uh, uh, participants. Um, I... And if you want to, by the way, if you want to talk about my other science fiction stuff, I'm happy to load that into this so you can so you can use pieces of it. Oh, that's that's very kind of you. Um, I will. I I I would have my friends and colleagues in the industry bashing down my door if I didn't ask you about a couple of your your notable credits over the years. I want to start with um, the role of, of Stanley Uris in the miniseries It, um, I, right. I guess alongside The Thing, and we'll get to The Thing in a minute, um, right. it, the, the, the work that has resonated with so many people um, of a certain age group. I think it came along at a time yeah. when the, the miniseries format was, was at a peak and creativity and within that format was at a peak and um, what 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 the team did with this Stephen King adaptation still remains extraordinary. What do you recall of, of shaping that character and that production? Well, um, the, the two guys who produced it, uh, Jim Green and Alan Epstein were, um, I had done another film with them um, and we, we had become good friends and they actually, I'd done two other things with them. I'd done a, a, a movie for television called Fallen Angel, which is a a really, really um, disturbing um, a TV movie about uh, child pornography, where I am a pedophile who recruits for uh, for a p pornographer, and um, uh, it's a very disturbing film, and it was brilliantly uh, handled by Jim Green, who who had come out of the marketing department at NBC and um uh, uh that was his background and he did some crazy smart stuff in terms of putting this out in front of the country before it actually aired so that there was a buzz going on among community leaders faith leaders educational people educators uh, before the film aired and a lot of people watched it the first time around, but a lot of people were afraid to have their children watch it with them, even though part of the rap was you should watch this with your kids because mm. um, it was a it was definitely a kind of a um, what's I, I'm losing the word, but a, a warning kind of a piece, you know, um, about what to be careful of. And um and and so many people. This was back when you 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 aired something, and then people wrote in. There was no internet, you know. So they got letters and letters and letters to local stations and everything, saying, "Oh my gosh, I watched this film, but I didn't let my kids watch it. When is it going to show again? I really want to watch it again with them." Mm. So they aired this. I think it aired initially in February, and they aired it again in April. Wow. And that had never happened before where a TV movie was aired twice. And I know I'm not talking about it. I'm getting. No, not anyway, at all. But it, it was an extraordinary experience. And 
And the, and the first time it aired, it was the highest rated TV movie of the season. And the second time it aired, it was the second highest rated TV movie of the season. Wow, it was cool. crazy. I mean, the combination was the largest audience, I think, ever for a, a, a TV movie. And, um, um, and there's a whole cadre of women who, when they see me, have this weird reaction and i know they saw me in fallen angel when they were 12 years old I just, or 11 years old i just oh, know it. anyway um um so jim and alan had done that and then they i i they asked me to come and do a, a, a play a bad guy in a pilot for john denver he should rest in peace uh, for john denver um um uh, pilot they were shooting about a um about a bush pilot who, coincidentally about a bush yes. pilot in um in alaska and um and i went and i did that with them and john was a, a doll and i mean it, it and and it was great working with them again so they called me up when they were doing it and they said would you you do us a favor would you come and do this role mm -hmm. i and i read it uh, i hadn't read the book but i when i read the script i went there's like it's so small really i mean really you want me to come up to vancouver to shoot this and they said yeah we really do you know and i said well what about this role what? no they're all cast everybody else was cast already said, okay fine i'll do it so i went up there one day and i shot i shot the scene where i get the phone call and then i'm dead in the bathtub i shot those that stuff in in the um uh, and then I came back to do the very famous scene in the refrigerator, um, which I, I mean, I can't do a spoiler on something that's been around this long, but <laughs> I'm a disembodied head in a refrigerator acting like an idiot. And, and, um, um, and so I was not up, I mean, there's a wonderful um, uh, cast photo of all of us on a staircase with, um, um, uh, um, Oh God, um, uh, uh, Pennywise. I'm just blanking on his name. Yeah. Um, uh, no, but the, the Tim Curry, wonderful the actor. Tim Curry. Yeah, Tim. Sorry, yeah. Uh, with Tim kind of being looking in the opposite direction, lurking in the background. It's so weird. Anyway, and everybody said, "So, what was it like being?" I said, "That's the only time I saw all those people was when we took that shot. I never worked with any of them." except for i think i worked with dennis i think he's the one who opened the refrigerator if i remember correctly yeah. and i think richard thomas might have been there too when we shot that that sequence um but yeah. it was such a it was an one of the most uncomfortable days i've ever had in my life shooting that scene because i had an actual refrigerator um this was before cgi or anything like that and I had a they they had taken an actual rack from a refrigerator, a little, a little, you know, under the counter refrigerator, and and carved and cut the 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 bars so it would fit around my neck. And then oh they made God. a piece that joined it to my neck, and then they glued it on me. And and I had and then they made me all up with the rest. So I had this thing on my head for seven hours before I actually shot. And every once in a while, I would send somebody out from the makeup trailer and say, what's going on? Are we gonna do this or what? And they kept saying, very soon, very soon. Finally, I got up out of the chair and I walked out and the director was right outside the makeup trailer. And, um, and, and I said to Tommy, I said, okay, you have 15 minutes to get me on the set and shoot me or I'm ripping this fucking thing off my throat and throwing it away and going home because I'm done. And he said, no, no, we're going to get that. No, I said, no, that's it. That's it. Put me in the refrigerator. You don't so leave, they did. And, you don't leave yeah, the star and, in the fridge for seven hours. What's, what, what were they thinking? Where's the producer? Right, right. The well, I wasn't exactly the star. But anyway, so, I, so, I'm, so, so I'm lying on the ground. I mean, they couldn't even raise this thing up. It was so, so I'm lying on the ground. They slide the shelf into the refrigerator and then they put a black over, 
uh, like along the edge of the shelf and covering my neck and everything below below the the rack. And then they started putting all this food all around me, you know, on the shelf. And um, you know, and it, it that didn't take that long. And I'm like this, lying on the ground. And then we start rolling. I did a few takes, and and. Um, when I said, do you have it? And he said, yeah. I said, get me out of this goddamn thing. And so they, they pulled me out and, and they took it off and I went home. Um, so I didn't have a, a big, I did it as a favor. I mean, to be perfectly honest. And I'm, I'm thrilled I did it. I was thrilled when I saw the picture. Yeah. Um, um, I was, I loved everybody else's work. I thought it was a real I mean, for a TV uh, miniseries at that time to to do the kinds of effects they did, and they were all practical effects, you mm -hmm. know, that, like I said, there's no CGI. It was all nonsense like what I did, you know, but it was, you know, weird moving things in the cave and all that, um, uh, or the sewer, wherever it was. And, yeah. and I, I, and it's been this ongoing, people love this loved it and they and really and they they say to me what do you think about the new one i said i thought the new one was great it was different you know the the, the two parts i thought were both very good mm -hmm. i thought i i don't i am not an enemy of cgi i think cgi has its place i think there are some things where where the practical effects are because they're more challenging to do well it's kind of it feels like more of an accomplishment and and so the true. early CGI was wanky, you know, but but just same with the early practical effects. But the thing, for example, that was the last great rubber movie. Well, exactly. I'll let let me get to the thing because you you, you choose your ensemble cast very well. You, you and, and and there's probably no, arguably no greater ensemble cast in in the sci-fi genre. Maybe Alien, but certainly the thing. Um, and you're right, it is held up as a, a landmark movie in terms of its practical mm -hmm. effect. Practical effects, excuse me. What do you recall of of working with those effects, of working with Carpenter, um, and of working with the dogs? Well, that was exactly the opposite experience from it because I was there for months. Mm. We all were. Um, the, the shoot, I think, all together was almost four months long. Wow. Um, we shot on stage for three months uh, at Universal in the summer, and we were all wearing all these big, heavy wool clothes, and going to lunch was a pain in the ass. Um, but we, we uh, and, and before we shot, we had two weeks rehearsal, which is so unusual. Even in a big feature, it's very unusual to get a whole cast together, but because we were all gonna be in it pretty much all the time, it, it was it made it logistically possible and and frankly it was a it was a wonderful cast of working character actors mm -hmm. who I mean just a an amazing assembly of men unfortunately it was all men but and we had um there was one guy who had never done a film before and that was T K Carter uh, maybe uh, Tom had uh, uh, Tom Waits had and uh, um, um, just trying to think. I don't, I'm not sure if Joel Polis had done a film before that. I think he had. Um, but pretty much everybody, all the rest of us had worked in some kind of a film at least. Or, mm. um, and, um, oh, Keith David had that was his first film. Oh, really? Wow. He was right out of Juilliard. And <laughs> I mean, and he was, he was really, you know, he was learning as he went you know it's a big change when you're you've been trained as a stage actor and you've done theater and then you come to do this film but you got your head in the fridge uh, yeah. surrounded surrounded by people with a you know i mean uh, me and and kurt well kurt for, had, had years of experience at that oh. point dysart um um donald moffitt uh, um, dave clennon you know there were a, a lot of people with a lot of a lot of mileage um, in the in the business. Mm. Um, anyway, and so it was a great it, uh, the, the the rehearsal period was great. Um, uh, Bill Lancaster, who wrote the script, was so 
open and and John was really quite open during the rehearsal period and we came up with a whole bunch of great stuff and and character dynamics that weren't necessarily in there because Keith and I were the two big guys you know we were like bigger than everybody else it it started being that we really hated each other and I hated everybody I mean because I only liked the dogs which is why I asked to do the role by the way John asked me what character I was interested in because I had known him I hadn't worked with him but he when I went to meet him about it um um well first of all I have to back up I I was, I mentioned I was always a science fiction fan from the time I was a kid. One of the ways I became a science fiction fan, we had a thing in, in New York um, in the 50s and 60s called the Million Dollar Movie. Uh -huh. And the Million Dollar Movie, um, they would show a film twice a day um, during the week. No, once a day during the week and then twice a day on the weekends. And so you could watch a film was nine times the same movie. Oh, if you could catch all those. What a dream. And when something like The Thing was on, I got really sick and couldn't go to school. Oh. The, the Thing from Another World Man was just like, and I had already, I had read the novella, Who Goes There? Because oh, wow. my father was a science fiction fan and I had read it in, an, in the old pulp, pulp version that it was originally published in. And so, and so I watched that movie. I never missed an opportunity to watch that movie. Loved that movie. Mm -hmm. And when this came, but I also loved the book, which was very different from the movie. And when, when this script came along and they had gone back to Who Goes There and weren't doing a, a remake of the movie at all, um, that was very exciting for me. So anyway, so John said, what are you interested in? And I said, well, I kind of like the, you know, the the colonel, uh, the guy who runs the place. He said, well, Donald Moffat's playing that role. I said, okay. And I knew he was playing McCready. And I said, I like Clark. Um, he said, really? He said, he doesn't have that many words and stuff. I said, I just love this guy. I love, I love that he only, that he hates everybody except the dogs. Mm -hmm. And I do have one of the best lines in the movie, you know, uh, so, which I noticed while I was reading it. So, um, and that that always helps when you have one of the best lines. I, I would say. Give us the line reading. What do you remember of that line reading? Can you uh, give it for line? us? I, I don't know what it is down here, but it's weird and pissed off. Whatever it is, okay. That was. I, I think I, I think I read it better on camera. Um, um, uh, but but that but the 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 best line in the movie is Dave Clennon when Charlie Hallahan, he should rest in peace. Well, his head is scooting out the door oh. and he says, you've got to be fucking kidding me. That's the best line. That's a great movie. line. I would also argue that maybe Donald Moffat's uh, line on the couch, get me off the, oh, yeah. the couch, is, is one of the great <laughs> moments in cinema. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great moment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is, that is. Um, uh, anyway, um, so... A, a wonderful... I, I lost track. I want a wonderful production um, and 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 has I, I I guess we're past being surprised as to why it's had such longevity and and has remained so um, uh, intrinsic to the to sort of you know modern science fiction horror genre it's, I'll, I'll uh, tell you one of the reasons uh, and John yeah I, I Simon I'll tell you one of the reasons I think that's the case and this has come up at some fan conventions I've gone to over over the years um, which I didn't do at all for many many years and then in the last se several years I've, I've gone to several and and I really get a, a, a wonderful it's a wonderful experience every time I go I always have a, a great moment with one or two people or several people about something that's just kind of magical but um, but what people always say to me is that what they love so much about the film is that it's it's the relationships between the people and the way the people in the in the film are with each other and what happens with them and everything else and how you get involved with them and 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 I think that's one of the things that has gotten a little harder to do with with the spectacle 
of a lot of stuff. Mm. Like, you know, I love Aliens, the, the uh, Alien, rather, the first movie, and I love Aliens also, the second movie. I love both those movies uh, tremendously. I thought they were just uh, done by two very different directors and, and beautifully, beautifully done, both of them. And the thing is, he he in both films you get forced down a channel where you're rooting for one person which is ridley mm -hmm. and and ridley is uh, you know is the focus of the film and in this mccready is the lead but he's not the focus of the film you know what i mean it's it's the crew is the focus of the film absolutely and um and so each one that gets that either turns into the thing or in my case gets killed. Um, 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 each one of us that gets carved off is a loss to the audience, you know, in this, because you have a relationship going with all of us and you, and you don't know who you're rooting for. Are you rooting for McCready? Well, only, only if he's not the thing, <laughs> you don't know if he's the thing. You know what I'm saying? It's and and are you rooting? Are you reading rooting for Childs? Well, yeah. only if he's not the thing. And everybody says, "Well, what's the ending?" And Carpenter always says, "Whatever you think it is." You know, yeah. he says, "I know what it is. I'm not going to tell you." You know, but you know who's really the thing, or is there really the thing? So anyway, it's but it's lot. but I think that's a lot of why Simon because, um. It's it's very 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 hard to create a film that's going to have the kind of danger and and thriller quality of something like this, where you're engaged with virtually every single character, including the dog for crying out oh, loud. You know, when dog. you first see the dog, he's like, "No, what are they doing? Oh my <laughs> god!" And then. And then I put him in the kettle and holy shit, what's that? You know, <laughs> well, I was rooting for that. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild. It's, it's such a great, and the dog, I just, let me go back to the dog. Cause you mentioned something about working with the dog. Jed was his name. He was, he was great. He was half wolf and uh, mm -hmm. half husky. And um, he, his trainer, Clint Rao was one of the, brilliant animal handlers i will call him because he he wasn't he wasn't a trainer in the conventional sense of the word though they the, the dogs he only worked with dogs or pretty much only worked with dogs the dogs he worked with were unbelievably special jed was and mike the dog i don't know if you remember a film called down and out in beverly hills oh, course, with yes. richard dreyfus and the dog in that mike that was Clint's dog also. And one time he came to my house because he knew I was missing Jed. And this was years, a couple of years later, he came and he brought Jed and he brought Mike. Both dogs <laughs> were at my house. And that was one of the great days of my life. Uh, there were such, Jed was a very young dog when we did the film. He was 18 months old. He'd only done one professional job before that, which was a, a, a still shoot in the Amazon, why they took the, uh, the Amazon, I don't know. But he'd done a still shoot there. And and Clint knew that he had it in him to have the kind of intensity that Carpenter wanted. But what he didn't know was whether or not Jed would be able to handle all the actions. Because Jed was a very high strung animal because of the wolf part. Of course, yeah. Um, and we worked a lot to get him relaxed with me and through me. And Clint's whole way of doing this was he had a relationship with the dog. Then he would establish in a relationship with me. Then I would, through Clint, develop a relationship directly with, with Jed. And then through me, he developed relationships with other people in the cast who he didn't have to see very often. There was really only a couple of scenes where he's walking through them or or coming in and lying down under the pool table where there were a lot of them around. He just had to be comfortable enough to not let them distract him. And, and the thing that he does in the film, and you'll know what I'm talking about, 
when he goes into the into the kennel, when I put him in the kennel, and he lies down, he goes like this. And when he does that look, that was something he had naturally, which he which he had from a puppy. Wow. And Clint said to me, this is a wolf thing. They don't bark, they don't growl. They when they're gonna when they're gonna attack something, they just look and then they go. Yep. There's no interim. So so when and Clint brought him on stage when we were rehearsing, it was a dark soundstage a huge soundstage with some tables in the middle and that's where we were rehearsing and i saw them walk into the soundstage and i wasn't in what we were talking about then and i walked away from the table i went over and they were sitting on the floor and i sat down and 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 jed was between us and we knew each other already we'd been practicing you know rehearsing together and and we were getting pretty good together and he liked me from the get-go so that was pretty easy that helped. but we're sitting there and we're watching and all of a sudden, Jed goes like this. And he turns to me and he gives me that look. Like, who the fuck is this next to me? And I, and I heard Clint go, Jed, no, leave it, leave it. And Jed went, what? Oh, I'm sorry, did I do something? You know, and he was fine. But he, there was that moment where he was just giving me the look. And so anyway, so Clint had seen this look in this puppy and he cultivated it so he would give him the look with no emotion behind it, but he would give him the exact same look on command. So he would go, Jed, look. And Jed would go, oh my gosh. And he'd just do that freeze. And what was so amazing about it was when you're doing a practical effect and you're putting the real animal into this position, if you can get him to be still for a few frames, you know, just absolutely frozen. Then when you bring in the thing that's going to blow up all over the place, that's going to replace him, mm. you can place it in the exact same spot. And, and you can actually, I, and I don't remember how they, I don't think they, you know, this is the way they used to do it in, in the days of, uh, um, you know, King Kong and stuff. They, they yeah. would, when they were doing stop action and everything, um, or th those kinds of effects. They would do what's called um, cutting in the camera, where they would do that and then they would cut and then they put in the next thing and they'd start Drop it in, yep. They didn't have to splice it and redo it or, you know, crossfade or anything. But so they didn't do that, but it was pretty close. And they, they, they moved the mechanical, mechanical thing. And that was one of the only effects that was done while we were all there on, well, I didn't, not all of us, but when a few of us were there on stage was was the initial opening up of the head yes. and then all the tendrils coming out. And I was there for that because I was working with the other um, dog handlers there. There, there, were, there were trainers from the Weather Wax company and the Weather Wax people were the most famous dog trainers in the world because of Lassie. They had trained Lassie, all the Lassie. And um, I mean, starting from the silent movie. And wow. and um, um, uh, and this was the son of the original, uh, I think, Russ or Ross Weatherwax. I can't remember. But anyway, um, but they, they had a, a couple of dogs, a few dogs in there that were well-trained. And then a few that were just dogs that they they would call over to the to the um to the edge of the cage and then they they'd hit them with a with a shock and they'd scream and they'd go crazy and they'd get shots of all that it wasn't a it was like what you would have on a training collar it was a little thing sure. but it was enough to make them freak out a little bit yeah. and clint couldn't be around when they were shooting that because he would never do that with a dog yeah he would never put the dog into that kind of stress Oh, extraordinary um, anyway, stories. so th that's a lot of dog stuff. But. No, that's wonderful. You have been, you've been so generous with your time, Richard. And and forgive me, we're not going to have time to talk about my forever crush, Heather Graham, on License to Drive, or or or, or um, the bit you did on the uncredited bit you did on one of my favorite films, The Falcon and the Snowman, or Cruise in Risky Business. No, in I wasn't in that. I wasn't in that. People you weren't in that? in that. They cut you no, out of I that. I wasn't. No, I was never in it. That's, the that's only film I, 
Everybody thinks I'm in that film, it's but I was never in it. Oh, no. There might be somebody, I don't even know who it is because I saw the movie. I didn't see anything that looked like. Now, I work with John Schlesinger on another film that he directed called The Believers, yes. which I definitely wasn't. With Martin Sheen, but, yeah. but I wasn't in Talking in the Snowman. Oh, that's but, correct. Um, that's nice. now, I only... want to go back and watch that again just to see if you're in or not. But now I know. Now I know. It's one the of my only favorite uncredited, movies. The only uncredited thing I did, I was actually cut out of, was um, White Men Can't Jump. I was in that movie and they lifted my entire character out of the film for time. It was only for time. Uh, they needed, the, the studio told them they had to, or the distributor told them they had to get eight and a half minutes out. My stuff was exactly eight and a half minutes oh, long. No. The director and the, and the, and the, and the editor were both good friends of mine, Ron Shelton and Paul mm -hmm. Cedar. And, and, and they, uh, they were very apologetic, and I said, "It's all right, you know, stuff happens." And yeah. and I had done it as a favor for Ron anyway uh, to do the picture, and and then the crazy thing is, is when they sent in the final cast list to the union, I was still on it uh, because it was before they made that cut, mm. which was at the very last minute. And because I was still on the final cast list, I got residuals for that movie. The entire time. I'm still getting residuals for it. It's uh, that, one of my favorite jobs. <laughs> that balances out all the rejections. That balances out all the tough times. That's good. Right, I, right, if, right. If I did